Hello viewers and welcome to yet another episode of Economic Sutra. In this episode, we are going to look into a very interesting topic, which is India's presidency of the G20, which is just about to start in the next few days. Now, what is this all about? Now, to give you some sense of it, we need to step back a bit and think about what is this institution at all. The G20 is a grouping of 19 of the most important countries in the world, plus the European Union. And this grouping came about because it was felt that there was a need for a body that was somewhat smaller and more coherent than the uh, United uh, Nations that would come together more actively and deal with the issues of the day. Now, of course, after um, the Second World War, uh, a big body called the United Nations had been built to coordinate uh, global issues. And while it did and continues to play an important role, it was felt by the 70s that a smaller body was needed that would uh, be able to uh, deal with issues in a more real-time basis. Uh, this eventually led to the growth of a body called the G7, which still exists, incidentally, of the world's largest uh, economies. But by the 90s, it became quite apparent that the G20 simply wasn't representative enough. So at the very end of the 90s, a new grouping began to emerge, initially with finance ministers and uh, uh, central bank governors, which eventually evolved into the G20. The G20 came together in 2008 uh, in the midst of the global financial crisis, which was uh, racking the world economy at that time. And since then, this has become really um, the grouping that provides uh, leadership on a variety of uh, global issues. For example, during the COVID crisis, um, as you will remember, um, both the UN and the WHO were uh, moving a lot slower than they should have at that point in time. So it was really the G20 with its global action plan that came up and uh, provided the coordination necessary for the world to keep functioning during those very difficult times. Now, how does this G20 grouping work? Uh, it doesn't have a permanent uh, secretariat. Instead, what happens is that every year a member country takes up its presidency. So this year in 2022, the presidency is with Indonesia and it will be passed on to India in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and so during the course of 2023, India will be the G20 presidency. So this is a real opportunity for India to show global leadership. And as you can imagine, uh, a big effort has been put into this. Now the G20 as it functions, functions uh, using two tracks. One is the finance track, which uh, is run by the Ministry of Finance. This really looks into various economic finance type issues. And on all other topics, the leadership is provided by what is called the Sherpa track. So to talk to you about this and more, we have India's Sherpa to the G20, Mr. Abhitabh Kant. Welcome to the sh uh, show. Um, let me start with the most obvious question, which is, what is the significance of India taking um, uh, the presidency on in this uh, period where, of course, we've just come out of uh, the pandemic. This will be hopefully the first full year uh, after the pandemic where we will, uh, where somebody will be uh, a presidency. The, both the, uh, the, the uh, Saudi and the Italian presidencies of uh, 2020 and 21 were, of course, impacted by uh, the pandemic. And even much of the Indonesian presidency was impacted by pandemic. So we will be hopefully the first year which will be fully on. Uh, we also take uh, on the presidency at a time when um, uh, there is a war on in Eastern Europe. There are issues with energy. Um, so uh, give us a sense of why this is an important thing, uh, uh, both for G20 and for, of course, India. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev, for having me on this uh, show. I'm truly delighted to interact with you. Uh, G20 is firstly important because it accounts for about 85% of the global GDP. It also accounts for about 78% of the global trade and two-thirds of the complete population of the world. But I think more important than that is that it's the only body 
which comprises of both the developed world, that is the G7, and of emerging markets. So United Nations is too large a body, it's too unwieldy a body. Uh, the G7 is too elitist a body and G20, because it comprises both developed and developing world, is the right body to take all the major global decisions in the world today. So the post-2008 financial crisis, G20 rose to the situation. On the issue of the debt, uh, much later, uh, the DSSSI, that the Debt Servicing Sustainability Initiative, came from G20 and many other initiatives have come from G20. Now, G20 in India will be held at a point of time when you will, by the time India takes over the growth, there will be a looming crisis of global slowdown of growth. In many parts of the world, there would be recession. There's a breakdown of global supply chains. We've seen the post-COVID pandemic impact across populations in the world. We've seen uh, action on climate uh, scenario uh, on a vast range of issues. And you've also had a situation where uh, geopolitics uh, is at its worst. You know, countries are not speaking to each other. And therefore, this is a major crisis in the world. There are a huge range of issues which are confronting uh, the world today. Now, every crisis is also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, uh, India gets this opportunity to be action-oriented, to, amb to be ambitious. Absolutely. And as the Prime Minister has rightly said, that India must set the agenda. This is what is important. That so far, we have been giving our comments to agendas being set by the developed world. This is for the first time that India gets the opportunity of setting the agenda for the world and getting other countries to react to that and being in a leadership position and to be able to really build consensus around many such issues. And therefore, this is a rare opportunity for India the Prime Minister wants the G20 to be held in all parts of the country, all states and all union territories, so that citizens of India are involved in this great huge process of G20. Also, that this is an opportunity so that the Sherpa track, which has 13 working groups, finance track, which has eight working tracks, and there are many, many engagement groups. There are about 11 engagement groups and during our presidency we'll have two separate working groups one working group relating to the disaster risk resilience and an engagement group which is the startup group which is a new initiative by india and therefore converging and integrating the sherpa track the finance track the engagement groups all to work towards the common objectives and the common priorities being set out by India for the bringing growth, dynamism, lifting people above poverty line, and ensuring that there is climate action. So, um, as you know, um, every G20 presidency has a theme. So, uh, for example, the Italians in, 2020, uh, in uh, 2021 had people, planet, prosperity. Um, the Indonesians have recovered together, recover stronger. Um, we have chosen our theme to be Vasubhadev Kutumbakam, which is the world as a family. Um, can you give us a sense of what is the significance of using this theme and particularly what, in what concrete way will this inform the way we uh, deal with the agenda? So Vasudev Kutumbakam really means one earth, one family, one future. It draws its inspiration from our ancient civilization that we are all, all of us, all human beings. This whole earth is part of one cosmic web and that there is unity in diversity. There is university in, unity in diversity as far as individuals are concerned. There is unity in diversity as far as countries are concerned. There is unity in diversity as far as philosophical thoughts are concerned. There is unity in diversity in different geographic models are concerned. But eventually we are all one human being and therefore we derive 
This basic principle that once we realize the essence of this, which is from our ancient civilization, that Mother Earth is really the foundation of all its children, that we will be able to draw peace, tranquility, a common agenda for growth and a common agenda for the progress of the vast segments of people who have been impacted due to COVID. 125 million people have gone below poverty line. 75 million people have lost their jobs. Uh, the world is facing a severe crisis of climate change. There's a, there are huge challenge of geopolitics. You have a scenario where we need people to work together, to interact together, and there cannot be a better theme than the ancient civilizational theme of India. That is Vasudev Kutambikam. That is, we are one family at the end of it all. So it is a philosophical theme. Mm -hmm. But behind this philosophy, there are many issues and there are many challenges. So the challenge for India will be really at this point of time to bring uh, inclusive, resilient and sustainable growth at the heart of our G20 presidency. There will be this challenge also of putting out, uh, accelerating the pace of SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because we'll midway through the 2030 agenda. And since COVID has impacted learning outcomes, health outcomes, nutrition, we need to accelerate the pace of it. And thirdly, that whatever growth needs to take place, as India has demonstrated, should be taking place with sustainability. The other key aspect is that the Prime Minister wants a lot of India narrative to come out. And India has created a unique model of digital transformation based on digital public goods. We have created digital identity, we have created data empowerment, and we have created fast payments, and we created many, many uh, unique models of public goods like Cohen, like mm -hmm. fast tag, like mm -hmm. digi locker, all these are public goods. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what India has demonstrated is this unique model. Mm -hmm. Normally, technological innovations come from the developed part mm -hmm. of the world. This is for the first time that a developing and an emerging market like India mm -hmm. has said that this is a model which ensures mm -hmm. both privacy and innovation. And you, you, can, you, you can create public tracks on which private sector can innovate. So India's own... So an important theme of this is going to be using the uh, digital commons to kind of weld together the world as a family. Would that be a, a, an important thing? Well, the important point which India will make is mm. that if you want to grow, if you want to prosper, mm -hmm. if you want to lift people above poverty mm -hmm. line, then you need a model like what India has created, the digital public infrastructure mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. because there is a recent study by uh, the, uh, the Bank of International Settlement which demonstrates that what India has achieved in the last seven, mm -hmm. eight years is more th than what it would have normally achieved in 50 years. And therefore, by building digital identity, it has been able mm -hmm. to ensure that it is able to put money into the bank accounts of people which between 2014 and 2018, 55% of the bank accounts mm. across the world were created in India. So everyone has a bank account. He's able to access that through his mobile. And there are no leakages. 600 schemes of the government, we put money straight into the bank accounts. And this has been huge transformation. So the, what we've created is a unique model for the world where private and public compete. India is the only com country in the world where Google Pay competes with Phone Pay, where WhatsApp competes with Paytm and in the marketplace. So we have pushed for privacy of data. We have pushed for digital identities. We have pushed for fast payments. The challenge in the world is that there are 4 billion people who do not have a digital identity. Mm -hmm. The challenge in the world is that there are close to 2 billion people who do not have a bank account. The challenge is that fast payments exist in only 55 of the 186 countries of the world. Mm. And therefore, India needs to tell the world that we are going to work with them to accelerate the pace of mm. growth through digital transformation. That will be the key. So let me change the uh, topic a little bit to uh, focus on the structure of the G20. What is the difference between the finance track and the Sherpa track? I know many viewers will be wondering the use of the term Sherpa. And uh, how do the working, all these working groups you mentioned, uh, how do they work? How is consensus reached? And, you know, 
as you know, I was um, I functioned uh, on behalf of India as the co-chair of the Framework Working Group mm. for five years, mm. uh, and it was an amazing uh, experience in terms of building uh, consensus. So, give us some sense of how uh, the actual functioning of G20 happened. Yes. So uh, let me go back in history a little bit and tell you that actually uh, this is an innovation from G7, okay. and the G7 realized that the growth of emerging markets is expanding and growing much faster than the developed world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, after, you know, many of the crises, if you look mm -hmm. at it, uh, the Russian financial crisis, the Mexican peso crisis, the Southeast Asian crisis, all these crises led to the G7 expanding the base to G20. And this was restricted originally to the finance minister and the central bank governors. In 2008, President Bush and the United States of America took the initiative to expand it to the leaders level. They realized that the challenges before the world in terms of growth, in terms of SDGs, in terms of climate are too severe, too, too acute. The challenges are too big to be just left, uh, to be not to be handled by leaders. And therefore, they started inviting the G20 leaders, a G20 working group with leaders was constituted where the then Prime Minister participated and then this grew. Now the challenge was that uh, G20 mm -hmm. faced, uh, you know, many crises but every time it has taken mm -hmm. a bold decisive action. The great thing is that there are many emerging markets. This is for the first time that you've had an emerging market like Indonesia leading it and passing the baton on to, to us. us. And we pass on the baton to Brazil, and Brazil in turn passes on the baton to South Africa. So there are four emerging markets. Who one will after be another. running the agenda yes, for four straight four years. years. So emerging markets have a very big role to play. Mm -hmm. The role of the Sherpa is critical. It's critical because he's like the envoy of the leader. Mm -hmm. So the, there are Sherpas from all these 20 countries. Mm -hmm. They are the envoys of the leader. They have to find a solution and arrive at the final communicate working in partnership with other countries. Mm -hmm. They are, the Sherpa basically means that Sherpa takes the leader up to the mm -hmm. summit and therefore uh, he has to take all the weight, all the conflict, all the Is that challenges. where the term comes from? <laughs> That's it. All the challenges, all these issues and find solutions okay. so that all the leaders are then able to sit and find solutions to the okay. challenges of the world. He's basically an envoy of the leader. Got it. Now, of course, we have discussed about how the government is going to be running, uh, uh, the, you know, and what the agenda of the governments will be. But of course, it's, uh, the G20 has now grown to be much more than just the government. There is a wider ecosystem of events that happen as well. So there is, uh, for example, the B20, which involves the business. There's um, all kinds of other non-government uh, organizations meeting on the sidelines and so on. Um, so can you give us a flavor of the wider ecosystem of events and uh, consultations and interactions that will happen? Uh, so Sanjeev, uh, during the course of our presidency, mm. there will be 200 meetings of the working groups. Uh, that is between the finance track and the Sherpa track. Mm -hmm. In addition to this, there are engagement groups. There are 11 engagement groups. And these engagement groups have their own meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, there are the business 20, there's the uh, youth 20, there's the community 20, all of them. Now, uh, business 20 itself will be having close to about 100 odd meetings. Uh, the Think 20 will have about 70 odd meetings across the country. So actually the country will see close to over 500 international meetings Good grief. during this period. The challenge for India is to ensure that every visitor who comes to India mm -hmm. during this period goes back totally spiritually invigorated, mentally rejuvenated and physically elevated as and goes back as an Indian. So we are trying to enmesh not merely the official business of mm -hmm. doing meetings, but to create a huge Indian experience mm -hmm. around culture, around cuisine, around a vast range of activities, so that the element of uh, close experiential India is built into this. And every, every single visitor will go back in, as an Indian from here. 
So over the next one year, I, I believe their meetings are going to be held over f in 55 different locations yeah. across the country. No, yeah. no trivial uh, number. Can you give a flavor of what are these, what are these locations, uh, how were they chosen, what, what, what should we expect in these places? So we worked in partnership with the state governments because after all, mm -hmm. uh, it's the state governments play a very mm -hmm. critical role. The Prime Minister mm -hmm. spoke to all the chief ministers mm -hmm. uh, and said that they should all actively participate. They should do their own uh, competitions. And therefore, we've tried to pick up the best talent for cultural shows. All the states are actively involved. We picked up key areas. Every state there will be a meeting. Every mm -hmm. union territory there will be a meeting. There are key areas. Uh, several uh, places where there is major... So give meeting. us that, some of the names where... So, say for instance, Kumaragam in Kerala, okay. uh, in the backwaters, Udaipur, Varanasi, uh, Mumbai, uh, look at uh, uh, Nagaland, Manipur, Andaman, so Lakshadweep. That's, that, that's quite something. Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, every, every places place. like Manipur, for example, yeah, would yeah. not normally... Absolutely. Not normally ho yeah, be yeah. hosting anything. So yeah, this, is, this is going to be quite... Yeah. So this experiment. is a pan-India movement. This is really about uh, making every citizen of India aware of the significance and importance mm. of what India is doing for G20 and how India has taken leadership position in the world. And that this is the first time that India is setting the agenda for the world. So just so that uh, viewers know, this is actually quite an experiment because Historically, G20 tends to be in just two, three locations and with repeated events. So, uh, for example, when now in Indonesia, most of the events are in Bali, uh, some are in Yogyakarta or in Jakarta, but there are three, four real locations where it happens yeah. and not much. This idea of spreading across the country in you know dozens of locations, 55 I believe, that in itself is quite a um, challenging thing to do. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, you know, we'll see how it works out, but it, 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 I would say it is a very ambitious thing to want yeah. to do in the first place. So, the Prime Minister was very clear that uh, this is, uh, uh, the G20 is being hosted by India for the first time. Uh, it has large number of meetings. We should not keep them urban centric. Mm -hmm. We should not restrict them to a few cities, which is always done, mm -hmm. Delhi, Mumbai, but to take them out, create the feel and experience of India for every guest who's coming. So there is a great experience in this. For instance, the Sherpa meeting is being mm -hmm. held in Udaipur, the foreign ministers meeting is being held in uh, Varanasi. There are many, many areas in, in, in Andaman, Lakshadweep, all these will get opened up. Fantastic. But the important thing, Sanjeev, is mm -hmm. that when you do this, mm -hmm. then you are really gearing up your infrastructure for that. So you yeah. ensure that local administration cleans up the city, it builds the infrastructure, it creates a Plus great there is feeling. a sense of national participation. And they, they participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not seen as something uh, divorced from the citizens. So the citizens mm -hmm. become active participants in the G20 movement of the world. So now um, let me take you to where this all culminates, which is of course in the leaders meeting, which will, I believe happened in September. So, give us a sense of what happens. All, all the top leaders of the world come to India. By the, incidentally, um, viewers, uh, of course, the G20 leaders will come, but uh, typically there are also guests as well, and we will be bringing in some of our neighboring countries into this. So, give us a sense of who are all these people who will come, uh, where will this big event happen, uh, what are the arrangements uh, that we are making to get ready for this. So, in addition to the G20, there are several invitees like Spain and Netherlands and so mm. on. And India, because it is hosting the summit, is inviting nine other uh, countries. Uh, several of them are friends such as Egypt and Bangladesh and Nigeria and mm. many other. Uh, the reason is to bring in a larger diversity and involve mm -hmm. them in this decision making process. In addition to that, there are international organizations like uh, IMF, World Bank, uh, ADB, our own solar agency and the CDRI mm -hmm. that is for disaster risk. And uh, all of them will participate act actively and therefore uh, the top leadership of the world, all the key leaders of the world from across the world and all the key 
decision makers from across the world will be in India. And this is the first time that you'll have about 43 leaders from across the world. 43? Leaders. So it's not 20. It's 43. It's 43. Leaders from across yeah. the world, in addition to heads of international organizations. India has never seen this kind of And this of is happening in Delhi? This will happen in Delhi towards the end in September. Uh, the dates are being worked out, but broadly around 9th, 10th and 11th of 9th and 10th, between 9th and 11th, mm -hmm. around that period, uh, we will work out and uh, this will be a unique gathering for India. And where will the event actually be held? Has uh, that been decided? So, uh, we are looking at different options, but uh, a new venue has been created in Pragati Maidan. Uh, so, I think that will so be So, Pragati Maidan will, will be an be important part. Ideal uh, venue for this. So, mm -hmm. a lot of work is going on there right now and this will be a unique experience which will be created. So now to our very last question, um, say a year from now, hmm. what do you think should have happened through the course of the year which will give us satisfaction that yes, this was a year where India did uh, give leadership and uh, hopefully we had a lasting legacy. What would be our sort of a, our goal and target uh, that we would try to achieve through this entire process? Uh, so Sajid, the critical thing is that uh, uh, I think it's important that uh, the presidency of India should have made the world realize that uh, we are all once uh, citizens of the world, that uh, we are able to spread this feeling of one family, one earth, and all of us, when we work <coughs> together, we really build the future. If you do not do this, you will create huge challenges on fuel, food, fertilizer, all these challenges will come in. We will create artificial problems for ourselves, whereas we need to work together. So that in basic essence of this. But behind that, I think the key challenge for India would be really to push for accelerated growth, uh, which is inclusive, resilient, sustainable. Uh, which benefits the citizens. Everything India will do will be for the citizens <coughs> of the world. Everything that India does, as the Prime Minister has decided, that will be for the global south, for the developing country, we will become the voice of the developing countries. Whatever we do will be for the sustainable growth and to accelerate the pace of sustainability and climate action. Whatever we do will be for the digital transformation of the world and whatever we do will be for women-led development who comprise 50% of the population of the world, as the Prime Minister has rightly said. So all of us, on all these issues, we'll work with the vision of the Prime Minister uh, who has laid, who will, will lay down the priorities of the country. So thank you, Mr. Kant. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, summary of what we uh, hope to see over the next one year. Um, so uh, thank you once again for Thanks. being on the show. And viewers... Uh, Thanks, my pleasure. <laughs> And viewers, uh, this brings us to the end of uh, one more episode of Economic Sutra. I hope you came away uh, feeling more educated about uh, uh, India's presidency and, uh, of uh, G20 in uh, 2023. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, will uh, get involved in, 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 uh, in multiple ways or will witness uh, many of some of the events that will go around it. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me say goodbye for now. See you at the next episode of Economic Sutra on Sunset TV. Thank you.